right. Can you all hear me all right? I think I know most of you, so <laughs> thanks, thanks for being here. Uh, thanks, Rebecca, for, for that generous introduction and for organizing this event. I know it's been kind of a, a task to get lectures back on the slate after the pandemic, so I'm excited to be um, talking here tonight. And I also hope you've all had an en a chance to enjoy the Biophilia exhibit out in the gallery. Um, it's a really perfect complement to this evening's lecture. Uh, whereas Rebecca mentioned, I'm gonna be sharing my work on the Sandy Hook Memorial, which we call the clearing. And uh, this, this project is really about biophilia um, and exploring how design based in process in ecology has the potential to interact with memory, trauma, and healing. So the image on the right shows the clearing prior to construction, and this image shows the clearing in September of last year, a little over a month before the formal opening. The process of transforming the space in the first image to what you see on the screen was a five-year journey for me and took twice as long for the people of Newtown. We'll be looking at some important moments from along the way. To begin with, I'm gonna be talking briefly about gun violence in America and how the design world and the art world have responded to that. And then we'll explore Newtown's own process of discernment for creating a permanent memorial to the victims of Sandy Hook I'll then walk you through our iterative design approach. And finally, I'm gonna discuss the implementation and completion of the project, highlighting some key moments during construction in the formal opening in November. After the presentation, there'll be a moment for uh, question and answer. So if you think of anything along the way, um, can talk about that at the end. So before I go further, I'd just like to invite you all to join me in a moment of quiet reflection and to just sit with whatever feelings come up for you when you think of the Sandy Hook shooting. Perhaps you remember where you were on December 14th of 2012 when you heard that 21st graders and six educators had been killed at school. For me, this was one of those moments in life. Some of you might have still been in grade school or middle school, after which active shooter drills likely became a regular part of your education. You might feel anger or sadness or anxiety, and many of us no doubt feel numb having seen on the news countless more times since Sandy Hook mass shootings in almost every venue of public life with no meaningful action to prevent them, only thoughts and prayers. In order to understand Newtown's nearly decade long process of creating a permanent memorial, it is important to understand how Sandy Hook and other mass shootings fit into the much larger story of gun violence in America and how the design world has responded. A lot of the data that we have studying gun violence comes from Every Town for Gun Safety, which is an organization that began in 2013 in the wake of Sandy Hook to fill a void of centralized data that our federal government has intentionally left unfilled for years. Every Town tells us that on an average year, about 40,000 people in the US die by guns. And while mass shootings loom large in the public psyche, they account for only a fraction of those deaths. Most, about 60%, are suicides. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they would not have happened or that they would have happened anyway. Having access to a firearm triples one's risk of death by suicide. Homicides make up nearly 40% of gun deaths, and that represents a broad range of scenarios, including mass shootings. According to Every Town, Half of all gun, gun homicides occur in just 127 cities. And gun violence of this nature disproportionately affects communities of color and communities experiencing endemic poverty. 
This is essentially an equity and justice problem inflamed by mind-bogglingly easy access to firearms. Memorials to community violence often have varying degrees of temporality compared to a formal monument. They might be murals, shrines, or other elements which become grafted into the fabric of a neighborhood. Mass Design, based in Boston, uh, designed the Gun Violence Memorial Project. This was an installation at the National Building Museum in Chicago. And to my understanding, this was the first broad memorial addressing this issue in America. And they used the single family home archetype as a way of demonstrating how ingrained this issue has become in many communities. And they constructed these of glass bricks to sort of convey how vulnerable people living in those neighborhoods are in light of that issue. We've also seen a broad reconciliation in public monumentation as it relates to the inequities that have perpetuated community violence. And while projects such as the Memorial for Peace and Justice in the top right, uh, or the Memorial to Enslaved Laborers at UVA in the bottom right do not directly address gun violence in communities of color, they do confront some of the root causes such as ancestral trauma. Mass shootings, which are considered to be a shooting that takes the lives of three or more individuals, make up a proportionately small amount of gun homicides. The operative word there being proportionately. Because since 2009, over 1,400 people have been killed in mass shootings and 1,000 more wounded. They're almost exclusively committed by men, and over half of them are related to domestic violence incidents, including Sandy Hook. There's still somewhat of an ongoing debate about why this issue has become so pervasive in America, but we do know for a fact that access to assault weapons and high capacity magazines greatly increases their deadliness. Mass, mass shootings in public spaces are for many of us a source of anxiety. People living in affluent and safe communities can and sadly do inoculate their minds from the hundreds of gun violence casualties that occur every day in cities across America. But it's hard for anyone to ignore mass shootings given that they happen seemingly anywhere regardless of race or socioeconomics. High casualty mass shootings rend our sense of societal order and boundary and have created a sense of unease in formerly safe commons. Schools, grocery stores, churches, movie theaters, parks, concert venues, these are all places where we've seen mass shootings in recent years. So it's not surprising that in light of that, we've also seen an increasing number of memorials to mass shootings, some of which are complete and others are in ongoing design processes. What strikes me is how each one reflects the community and the context that it's designed for. On the top is the uh, One Pulse Memorial concept designed by Coldefi Associates, a French architecture firm. And that was designed as a memorial district for the victims of the Pulse nightclub shooting. Others are humbler in scale, such as the Curtain of Courage in the bottom left, which was designed by Walter Hood for victims of the San Bernardino shooting. And that memorial tries to create moments of intimacy within the sprawling urban landscape of Southern California's Inland Empire. The Grand Candela in the bottom right is another SWA project. This was designed by Gerdo Aquino and Ying Yu Hung in SWA's Los Angeles studio. And it was commissioned directly by Walmart Corporation on whose property that shooting occurred. And that memorial had to sort of stand out in a, in a landscape of big box retail signs. And it also was intended to be visible across the border in Mexico where many of the victims lived. In 2017, when Dan and I began our work on Sandy Hook, the only existing memorial to a high casualty shooting was for the victims of Columbine in Colorado. And this project was designed by students, teachers, and family members uh, in a sort of collective effort. And it, in some ways, it feels like a product of a moment when we didn't yet realize that this would become a regular part of life in America. So Newtown's own process of creating a permanent memorial was deeply local and followed the contours of a trauma which has continued to evolve well beyond the tragedy itself. 
Sandy Hook remains the deadliest school shooting in American history, taking the lives of 20 children and six educators. And of course it shocked the world, but it completely upended what was previously a sleepy suburban community in Connecticut. In the days, weeks, and months following the shooting, Newtown was flooded with flowers, stuffed animals, and other artifacts sent from all over the world, which piled up in makeshift memorials around town. Additionally, millions of dollars flooded in with nowhere specific to land. Imagine being a small town mayor and all of a sudden $120 million shows up on your doorstep with nowhere to put it. So organizations such as the American Red Cross stepped in to manage the don donations and in years since have been criticized for misdirecting the funds in ways that work better for them than for Newtown. And then as everyone here is also likely well aware, there's been pernicious conspiracy theories that have risen up around the shooting almost immediately after the tragedy. And I'm not gonna give platform to those here other than to say how invasive they've been, especially for the families. So all of these experiences, the shooting itself, the overwhelming volume of tokens from well-meaning people that sort of took over the fabric of the town and the mismanagement of donations and then the co-option of a narrative by for-profit conspiracy theorists influenced how Newtown would approach the possibility of a permanent memorial. They wanted more than anything a space for Newtown to remember the lives of the victims in a process informed largely by the families and not outside interests. So in 2013, the town formed the Sandy Hook Permanent Memorial Commission. This was less than a year after the shooting. It had 12 members, all local residents, four of which were parents of children who were killed at the school. And the parents would act as liaisons to the broader community of victims' families. According to the Newtown Board of Selectmen, the commission, the commission was appointed to lead the community through the process of determining the nature, location, and funding of a permanent memorial to the victims. They would receive advisory support from members of the 9-11 Memorial Commission, as well as local landscape architects and architects. Through in-depth discussion and stakeholder engagement, they asked, should there be a permanent memorial? To which they answered yes. They asked what kind and determined that it should be grounded in nature and avoid the toxic politics surrounding the shooting. They asked how it should be funded and given prior experience with outside donor organizations, they opted for a memorial which would be humbly funded by local taxpayer dollars. They also asked where it should be and they explored a range of sites, one of which being in the bottom right, but they ultimately settled on the closest site to the rebuilt school because of its natural setting and because you could hear children playing at recess. The site, which is outlined in red, was donated to Newtown by the Sandy Hook Boys Athletic Club and was in decades past a Little League baseball field. It's surrounded by uh, woodland open spaces and small farms and uh, kind of suburban residential neighborhoods. And then the curving structure to the southwest is the rebuilt Sandy Hook Elementary, which is on the same site as the former school building, which was demolished less than a year after the shooting. The site was naturally partitioned into four distinct zones by topography. There's an upper field, which has the property line running through it, uh, this area here, and then an intermediate field, which is sort of where we got the name for the clearing, a low area with two ponds and wetlands, and then a ridge at the southeastern end of the site that's covered in hemlock trees. Prior to construction, the site was in a semi-abandoned state. And the meadows were dominated by invasive annuals with an understory that was overgrown and cluttered with dense shrubs. The ponds were deemed to be eutrophic, having too much organic matter in them to support fish or breeding amphibians. But the most important attribute of the site was, in spite of its feral qualities, it had this gentle and embracing beauty and a topographic sighting that along with the surrounding woodlands created a sort of introversion that helped to quiet both literal and figurative noise from the outside world. 
So once they had selected the site, the last question they had to answer was who should design it. And for the commission, this felt like the one key part of the process where remaining local would be too limiting. So they created an open invitation to designers to submit ideas in a blind competition format, at which point Dan and I entered. So this was 2017 when Newtown put out the invitation to submit, and I was a junior staff designer at SWA San Francisco at this time, regularly working with Dan Affleck, who is an associate at SWA with a background in oil painting and architecture, and who happened to be from Connecticut. We decided to pursue the invitation together outside of work, thinking it both unlikely that we would be selected, but also feeling that if we engaged the rest of our very capable colleagues at San Francisco, we would quickly have a too many cooks type of situation. We wanted to explore a design problem that had a deeper impact and more potential to connect with land, ecology, and human experience than the large scale economically driven work that SWA typically works on. So we would meet at bars in West Berkeley where we were both living and would spend our coffee breaks walking and talking about how to approach the memorial on the site, which turned out to be fairly tricky in a number of important ways. For the first of two months we had to work on the, init on the initial competition phase. We processed without really designing, finding it very difficult to put pen to paper. In our conversations, we would internalize some key guidelines from the commission, that it should be natural, quiet, serene, and embracing. It should memorialize the victims and the beautiful essence of their individuality instead of the actual event, that it should communicate the limitless possibilities of children's imaginations but not be childlike, and that the design should respond to and respect the existing natural conditions while engaging the entire site. We also canvassed memorial designs from around the world, but particularly in the US. And for us, two key memorial typologies emerged in our precedent research. The first we identified as the heroic form, which literally originates from monuments to war heroes and was first stylized in the modern era following the French Revolution. This typology has evolved significantly, especially in the wake of Maya Lin's seminal Vietnam memo uh, War Memorial, which embraced the political nature of monuments but overturned the prerequisite nationalism. Memorials are still frequently conceived of in this vein. This is the Sean Collier Memorial in Boston. Um, but their formal nature is not heroic in the classical sense of valor, more in that the form acts as a single muscular intervention on a site, employing a powerful sense of metaphor while maintaining the traditional approach to material permanence. Through form, it's suggestive of an event's impact or a transformation it catalyzed in a society. The second typology that we encountered was what I'll call the symbolic array. This is essentially a meaningful number of symbolic objects and has echoes of various typology of burial ground. Examples include the Pentagon 9-11 Memorial and the Oklahoma City Bombing Memorial, many others as well. This typology emphasizes collective stake in a tragedy using a representative object as a module within a larger field condition. And it conveys scale and often conveys scale of loss with potentially powerful effect. Both of these are typically set in civic or institutional contexts though sometimes they're woven into an urban fabric. In some cases, such as with war memorials, a heroic form may feel necessary to lift the weight or magnitude of an event. The symbolic array has been employed at great scale too, such as with Suzanne Furstenberg's ongoing installation of flags, this is in the DC um, mall, and memorializes uh, lives lost to COVID-19 in the US. There are certainly other typologies than these two, but they emerged as sort of the most pervasive. And Dan and I felt that both could be perceived to emphasize the event rather than the victims or the emotional aftermath for survivors. 
Meanwhile, we spoke extensively about trauma and its long-term impacts, and we spoke to people close to us who had experienced unimaginable traumas in their own lives, as well as people who worked closely with trauma survivors. In these conversations, we saw a departure from the experience of survivors in the way that memorials are typically conceived. For survivors, healing and memory are not linear processes. They have ups and downs which take on different shapes throughout people's lives. A grand formal metaphor or a symbolically powerful display of the quantity of loss do not really address these dynamics, but instead communicate significance in more of a political manner and they communicate permanence. So we saw an opportunity in the site that the Memorial Commission had selected and in the guiding language that they'd provided to explore an alternative paradigm for what a memorial could be, one based in biophilia. The Commission's desire to focus on the lives of the victims rather than the shocking manner of their deaths suggested to us that a common thread might be found between the ongoing experience of survivors and the need to honor the victims who were living, breathing beings with unique personalities. At this point, the concept of unifying natural and emotional systems emerged. Embedding the inherent fluctuations of nature into the memorial would act as a sort of mirror or conduit for emotional experience, while also acting out in real time the dynamics of life through ecological processes. We embrace this as a guiding principle for how to address the site formally, identifying three organizing elements which would embody this unification, the circle, the path, and the tree. The circle was a gesture which could organize a topographically fragmented site into one holistic experience while also acknowledging that trauma is a nonlinear process with no definitive arrival or endpoint. At the center, we imagined a second smaller circle, something with water incorporated, which would allow for communal gathering. Within that circular construct, we felt that multiple pathways would promote exploration of different environment, environs through walking and inviting activity to engage both body and mind in the space. This would also allow individuals to take their time and feel agency in determining their own path to the center. Another acknowledgement that memory is an iterative process. Finally, using a tree as the centerpiece would clearly demonstrate that the space is a story about life. It would allow for users, especially those who came back again and again, to very tangibly experience the site maturing over time. It was also an embrace of life's fragility. While a tree speaks to resilience, it also requires nourishment. And I'll say that for Dan and I as designers, it did feel like a risk to rely on a single living thing as the defining feature, because once in the ground, the tree is gonna to continue to grow independent of us. It'll be subject to weather, climate, and the skill of caretakers. But we believe that the symbolism was too powerful not to take that risk. And the Memorial Commission and victims families had a particularly strong response to that element. So we felt that it was the right risk to take. We ultimately selected an Eastern Sycamore for its hardiness in its relationship to water. Though during the implementation process, we would change that to a London Plain, which is a, a Sycamore hybrid because it avoids a few non-fatal diseases that trees get. So with these three organizing elements in mind, we created a topographic study which used earthwork to unify the partition site. And from that grading study, we produced this first plan graphic, which would be the future component of our first phase design submission. We wanted to convey that the site was a whole fabric con composed of uh, multiple strands, but abrupt drops in the topography between each zone made this difficult without greatly impacting the site. Notably in this phase, we had reduced, we had combined the two ponds into one larger pond and that was really sort of a graphic decision. Um, we felt that two evenly sized ponds was almost a distraction because two is a very strong number, especially in symbolic spaces relating to symmetry and binaries that didn't have a clear relationship to Sandy Hook. This plan included braided pathways through drifts of garden and woodland, and it had a central feature composed of concentric rings 
with a water feature encircling the sycamore tree, a long boardwalk over the reconfigured ponds and an overlook on the ridgeline provided opportunities for visitors to experience different ecological textures. So at this point in the design process, we were really thinking very diagrammatically. We were thinking about this as a competition and having a graphic that would pop off the page rather than something that would be overly analytical or technical that would get lost in the details. Um, and, and so we, we wanted to convey an idea that could be taken in at a single glance. In reality, this would have required major hydrological and ecological disturbance on the site, and so it was not truly in keeping with our intent of unifying natural and emotional systems. As a graphic, however, it did communicate the concept and it clearly engaged the entire site. Our understanding is that the Memorial Commission also immediately connected with this image of the central water feature, which depicted candles spiraling towards the tree at the center. You can see the names of the 26 victims arrayed evenly around the outside, and we envisioned that the feature would have water circulating inward toward the tree, and that the torus shape of the pool would inherently create a spiraling motion that echoed the landscape around it. This inward flow could gradually carry objects across the water in an act of symbolic nourishment or embrace, offering visitors a way to actively participate in the space. So while the circle, paths, and tree provided a formal organizing strategy, ecology would define the texture and atmosphere of the space. The drama of nature plays out on multiple timescales, days, months, seasons, and years, and in doing so it connects with our bodies through our circadian rhythms and with our souls in a way that grounds us in a place. Nature is a reliable element in its patterns, but it's also open-ended and ever-changing. This is something which humans have intuited for centuries and something that the community in Newtown, based on their guidelines, already knew that they needed. In the built environment, how else could you make sense of such an unanswerable tragedy other than by relating to nature? Another factor that we had to consider was that the shooting happened on December 14th, so how the site would feel in winter was a critical question. In our design, we extended the, in our initial design, we extended the hemlock stand all the way around the southwestern edge of the site, imagining that being enclosed by evergreens would lend reassurance to visitors in sensitive moments. Within the site, we wanted to include perennials, which would provide some color during winter, um, specifically dogwood and winterberry, but we, we did carefully avoid more common cultivars of these species, which have showy red stems and berries that might have reminded visitors of blood. And we favored varieties that had uh, golds and oranges to bring some warmth into the space. Later in the process, we'd bring on a local landscape architect, Tara Vincenta, and her team at Artemis, they're based actually right in Sandy Hook, to leverage their knowledge of local plant communities and their relationships with regional nurseries. So Tara took our conceptual planting plan and refined it, choosing the best cultivars or sharing caution around various species that she knew tended to struggle in that area for one reason or another. These are the, the boards we submitted in our initial competition phase and at the point that we sent these in, we felt very strongly about our approach, but given the nature of competitions, we were well prepared for our involvement to end there. The commission had a fairly strong reaction to our design, however, uh, and a unanimous reaction, um, very positive uh, feeling about the concept, but a sense that it was too impactful to the site. Um, out of 189 entries, they selected 13 semifinalists for further consideration, still working off blind submissions at that point. And then they, they eventually narrowed the pool to three finalists, uh, including uh, Minneapolis' own Damon Farber, um, at which point the entrants were revealed to the commission. Finalists were given some specific feedback to their design and 
they would present modified designs to the commission at an in-person interview. The feedback that Dan and I received was essentially that the families had a strong preference for our concept, but that it was not feasible as designed, and could we reduce the grading and keep both ponds? So uh, at that point, we also shared our work with our managers in San Francisco and opted to move forward with the project through SWA, uh, feeling that two unknown designers with no firm structure might seem risky to the town and that setting out on our own on the backs of a project that realistically might have never been built seemed too risky for us. So in summer of 2018, we, we flew out to Connecticut to see the site in person for the first time and we worked out of Dan's childhood home in West Hartford where we produced this plan which featured Many of the same elements, but scale, scaled down. We let the ridge stay untouched uh, because accessing this area required too much grading um, to not greatly impact the ponds around it. Uh, we also kept both ponds as we were asked to. And we were asked to add this emergency vehicle access, this little appendix, which has always bothered me um, and we, ultimately removed from the design. And we presented this to uh, the, sorry, presented this to the commission in a public interview and a month later learned that we had been selected, which was a fairly overwhelming moment for both of us. Um, and they wrote that we'd satisfied their concerns and the design was unanimously preferred and by the way, how much will it cost? Um, we estimated that to be about $12 million and at that, that number would set off a long and, and fairly tenuous stretch during which I was sure many times that the project was not gonna happen. Uh, just about everyone we spoke to was sure that with fundraising, the project could be built three times over in a heartbeat, but due to the town's prior experience with donors, they were very much opposed to bringing in outside money. So we produced numerous iterations, this being just one of them, where we're trying to get down to the right number while still preserving the design intent that the commission had approved. We were always challenged by the reality that this site had no uh, existing infrastructure on it, no plumbing, no electrical, no roads, no nothing. And that significant earth moving would be required to get down to the lower areas. We, we were finding that the infrastructure, no matter how we designed it, was taking up at least 40% of the cost. Uh, so getting the actual experiential elements was very de uh, difficult. Finally, in 2021, about two and a half years after our initial design was chosen, we arrived at this plan, which focused the memorial to the lower clearing area. And it maintained the original organizing components of a circle, paths in a tree, but it did not engage the further reaches of the site. This design came in at about 3.2 million, including contingency, barely more than a quarter of the original estimate, but a number that the, excuse me, that the town felt comfortable putting on a ballot in which ultimately passed in April of 2021. And this would go on to be implemented. In hindsight, this, the uh, scale of the original design reflected the Sandy Hook shooting as it felt to citizens of the national community, not the local one. And as it evolved, it sort of right sized to the intimacy of the trauma as it was felt by Newtown and particularly the victim's families. The scope being limited by budget also allowed the site's natural qualities to speak more forwardly in the design, which I've come to appreciate. This section of the downsized uh, concept reveals the value of leaving the eastern half of the site undeveloped. So as you descend into the lower clearing, you're able to sense a natural containment with the sky right above you, and you feel sheltered with the woodlands around you from the hustle and bustle of the broader world. Excuse me. So the, the threshold into this space is, has a southern aspect, so it's very welcoming. It's well lit and it's warm when you enter during the day. And by contrast, the eastern portion of the site with the ponds is perpetually shaded by woodland. And this area is only visually accessible to visitors. 
It's recessed and it's filled with reflections and shadows and the sounds of frogs and insects and birds and generally gives the air of something wild and mysterious. It creates a second threshold which you can walk along but not cross that sort of acknowledges the anxiety that many visitors will bring to this memorial with them. The ecological expression of these different zones also reinforces the emotional dynamic. In the exposed portions of the site, we find bright and exuberant wildflowers, while in the shaded areas, stranger things are growing, some of which we introduce to the site, others which are growing in spite of our intervention. Whichever path you choose through the site, you're carried along this shaded periphery, but are always guided back to the center where we have a mingling of both light and shadow throughout the day. The water feature itself was designed such that it could respond to this push and pull, because as we spent more time on the site, we became attuned to the rhythms of wildlife and how they followed the course of the sun. When we would show up early in the morning for a site visit, the dawn would be alive with sounds of woodland fauna. And then you're hearing machines all morning until around 11 when the contractors would break for lunch and you could appreciate the silence at midday when only quieter creatures such as hawks or butterflies would show themselves. And then once we had the water feature running, it became very apparent quickly that the sound of the water was incredibly enticing under the hot sun. So this inspired us to work with our collaborators at Fluidity in Los Angeles to program the feature such that it would be calm at dawn and dusk when reflections are more dramatic and when the sounds of nature are livelier. While during the day it would crescendo to an almost creek-like sound that would invite you towards the center. So to wrap up, I wanna speak about the implementation process which I had the opportunity to lead on behalf of SWA. And the entire experience of working on this memorial has been very profound for me, but the construction was special in its own way because of any job site I've been to, uh, the, I just found that the collaborators had an entirely different approach to the work that they were doing. Uh, they, they all approached the space with a sense of deep and personal respect for the fact that this was a memorial to children and educators and they really brought their best to the space. This was made more poignant whenever family members of victims would occasionally stop by to see the progress, such as the father of a slain teacher who came by on the day of his late daughter's birthday to leave these flowers near the survey point for the sycamore tree. We had many such experiences along the way. Every time it was very moving. Uh, Downs Construction Company, who built the project, would break ground on the site in late August of 2021, but because the project would feature extensive swaths of sown seed meadows, we had to prepare the lower field area, which was filled with invasives, by mowing it prior to seeds being grown so that they would lose a generation, giving the perennials more opportunity to thrive. And before this, uh, our, our collaborators at Artemis had actually installed test plots in the fields uh, with two different seed mixes in different locations, looking at areas with varying degrees of sun exposure, uh, different treatments of the soil surface, and they documented the growth in these test plots so that they could uh, tailor their seed specification prior to installation the following spring. Following the mow, a team came out and cleared and grubbed the overgrown understory, removed larger debris such as this huge pine tree that had fallen in one of the ponds to help catalyze higher oxygen levels. The field was scraped and excavation began for the water feature. And during the excavation process, the contractor would uncover numerous large and small field stones such as these which had been left in the low-lying areas by ancient glaciers. And they also found the remains of a 19th century barn foundation on a neighboring property owned by the town. And we were able to request that all of these rocks be set aside and provided sketches to the contractor for how they should be distributed throughout the site once the grading commenced. The team also found that groundwater 
flowed steadily through the site from uplands nearby down to the wetlands in the lower half of the site. And so this combined with the ideal sandy loam soils boded very well for planting to come. By far the most complex part of construction was the actual structure of the water feature. Uh, the concrete needed to be perfectly circular so that the 26 stones with the names of the victims would fit evenly. And um, a circle is very easy to create mechanically in a shop, but by hand at a large scale out in the field, a perfect circle is a very hard thing to achieve. So Jason Smith here and Mike Delaccio, the superintendent and project manager for Downs, had to work very meticulously with the concrete contractor to ensure that it was just so. The, within the circle, we had 26 of these niches, uh, each of which would house intake and outtake nozzles so that in operation, the water feature would have water emanating from underneath every place where there was a victim's name, and then a small inner ring that had half as many of those niches. And meanwhile, local masons were mocking up the stone cladding for the feature. And we used granite sourced from nearby Vermont, which was cut in Montreal. This is Jason again, the superintendent. And then masonry installation took place over winter with partial tenting uh, to help dry mortar. There's a particular detail that I'd like to call attention to, which only occurs twice in the 26 modules. Uh, the, the feature was otherwise perfectly even, but we felt that it might be an intense moment for uh, family members in particular, or people who knew uh, the victims when they approached this space to have to search for a name and then be sort of surprised by coming up on them. So we wanted to have some subtle type of keystone that they could orient themselves to as they approached. Around the feature, Masons installed cobblestones, which were donated from a local supplier. And these were cobbles that had not made the cut for selling because of imperfections, but we rather liked their rustic form and the way that they sort of contrast and emphasize the refinement of the feature itself. We then commissioned the water feature. This is Jim Garland from Fluidity. And we wanted to get the speed just right. Jim talked about making sure it didn't feel like a Disney water feature, nothing too exciting, um, but something more meditative. So we would spend time walking around the feature with him, putting a two by four or a little boat in the water to see if the pace matched a natural walking pace. Planting went in April, May, and June of 2022, beginning with the central tree, which was field grown across the border in upstate New York. Uh, Dan and Tara went out and selected this tree on a day where it was below, uh, I think 10 below zero. Um, and then it was brought out in the spring. It had to be lowered into the central feature by crane. Here's Tara helping the team to guide it into place. After that came dogwoods and maples. Dogwoods went in blooming um, and were some of the best specimens I've ever seen. And after that, we had perennial shrubs in understory plantings, and finally the hand-sown seed meadows. Because the memorial wouldn't open till November, we actually had a full growing season where the planting would not be disturbed, and there was a six-foot high security fence around the site, so not even deer could get in to eat the tender seedlings, so it was really kind of an ideal uh, germination condition. By uh, late July, the meadows had grown in significantly with prominent showings from black-eyed Susans, which are an early successional species. In the years to follow, we'll see a lot more variety as more patient wildflowers start to come in. The very last element that we installed was uh, a welcome sign made of Corten steel. This has a quote from President Obama's speech to Newtown the day after the shooting. And actually within the sign is a cubic yard of ashes from the cremated remains of teddy bears and flowers and cards and all sorts of other things that were sent to Newtown that they had nowhere to put. So they just burned it all, put it in a box and, and called it the sacred soil. Um, so all of that is sitting in this piece here. 
The following photos show the space prior to opening, but after completion. Uh, th these are by SWA's photographer, David Lloyd, and a independent ph photographer, Neil Landino, who's based in Connecticut. Um, and the way that they were able to capture the seasonal transformations really affirmed our intent of grounding the space in ecology and in nature. Uh, during the, the months before the opening, we also know that many families stopped by for private visits and their reactions were also very deeply affirming for us uh, because ultimately the space was designed for them more than anyone else. So after June, I personally did not have another opportunity to visit the site until the opening weekend. And uh, November is not as pretty as October when these photos were taken. But when I got there, I noticed something very peculiar and really almost magical. And I wonder if anyone here can tell what that might be by looking at this photo. I know a few of you already know, but. If you look at the, the tree in the center and the woods around it, you'll see that all of the trees have lost their leaves completely, but the tree in the center is still completely green. Uh, does anybody have an idea of why that might be? Nope. There you go. It's, it's got its own microclimate around it from the water and the structure of the water feature. And so I'll, I'll readily admit that we did not intend for that to happen, uh, but it certainly it's one of those things in, in implementation that you can just, it's, it's so much better in real life than, than anything you could have anticipated. There's obviously many things that in any project you would do differently, but this was sort of our, our magic moment. So the, the project was opened on November 12th. Uh, they opened it about a month before the 10th anniversary of the shooting. Many of the families don't like to be out in public on the 10th anniversary, so they wanted to have a private event prior to that. And the following day, the space opened to the public. They left wreaths with candles in them that the families had brought for the public to see floating around the pool. Many people brought their own flowers to leave. And then a month later, we had the uh, 10th anniversary, no formal event for this, but lots of people came from all over the state, potentially further, I'm not really sure. It was a snowy day, uh, which I think was wonderful. And I'll leave you with this quote that inspired us from an early point in the design process from Rebecca Solnit's Wanderlust. Paths are a record of those who have gone before, and to follow them is to follow people who are no longer there. Thank you. Do you want to turn the lights up, Rebecca? No. Yeah. Of course. Any questions or? Yes, sir. Yes. 
thanks a lot for that. I was, I was with Dave Farber. Oh, great. And so I, I don't remember what happened. I know that we, our presentation got followed up somehow, so I don't know if you have any thoughts there, but um, I did have a question about offsetting of the wall and the mountain. Can you mm -hmm. that again? Like, what was the purpose again? Uh, sorry, can you, what, what's the question? The, some of the pieces are offset, you said. Uh, like this, this detail here? Yeah, so this happens in two locations where paths enter the central space, and the point was so that because it's so even, we wanted particularly family members who might come multiple times to the space to have some sort of visual cue that they could almost count from and say, like, I know it's, you know, uh, five stones beyond the keystone, rather than having to search when they're sort of in this um, sensitive place of, of visiting a memorial to their uh, murdered child. Yes? I, my, I, I had visited the site and had um, experienced that spot where they're pulled out as like arms folded. Yeah. It well, it varies throughout the day because it you know changes from that calm to a uh, uh, more um, creek-like pace, but we sort of tuned it to that uh, strongest flow, and there were. This is a very technical question, Andrew. Um, I can't remember what the exact flow rate was, but it was, it was something like... Um, is it circular? Or is it it's circular. Yeah, so it's circular. Every, every um, name stone has uh, an intake and an outtake underneath it. And so the water is flowing evenly from around the side. Uh, and then there's 13 on the inside. It can actually reverse flow, typically it flows from in to out, or out to in, but sometimes they reverse it. And uh, let's say it was like zero to 60, I think is literally the way that the pumps were designed. I can't remember 60 what the unit was, but I think we ended up at like 35, um, where like if you put a two by four in the water and walked, it would sort of follow you around <laughs> how, how is it maintained? Does it maintain itself or does it require? The water feature or the, the whole memorial? Yeah. Um, it's, it's maintained by the town's uh, public works department. Um, so we're, we're curious if in years to come there'll be something like a Friends of the Sandy Hook Memorial um, that comes in to take care of it. There's certain compromises we made because it's a public maintenance budget. Uh, we, we really wanted to have um, river rock in the basin of the water feature because it would sort of create this creek-like feeling, but they just didn't feel like they could keep it vacuumed essentially. But it's the sort of thing that if, you know, they had a, a designated group of people who had funding, you could very well do that in the future. Uh, good question. Um, yeah, so they they were all able to list exactly how they wanted their child's name. Some some did middle names, some did um, multiple middle names, uh, some did an abbreviated version of their child's name, which is what they knew their child by. So um, it was on a per family basis, but I can say that I've never spell checked something so many times as those coping stones. Um, yeah. 
So what other surprises did you have? You talked about the uh, the stones that were donated, and I think it creates a great contrast to the smooth granite uh, stones that surround the pond. Were there any other big uh, beside that in the sycamore tree in the uh, in the winter or the late fall? I think certainly finding all the large stones in the ground was uh, incredible. I mean, as soon as things like that come up, you know, you pay thousands of dollars for stones like that. So to have those just coming up out of the ground, almost more than we knew what to do with, was really a gift from the site. Um, I think I think that uh, just generally the kind of quality of the nature in the space as as it became refined um, really it was something special it was, there, you know it, it's naturally a clearing and so working with that was really easy um, we didn't have to do anything to make the trees in the forest around it feel like they had already been there because they were already leaning into the space you know they're not we didn't have to clear a bunch of trees and then feel like we just clear cut a forest. So there was, there was something very intuitive just about the nature of the site and it seemed to receive the design in a very uh, welcoming way. It's a good question. Um, I, you know, it'll require management. Uh, there was talk of putting aerate, aerating um, features into the ponds that we didn't have budget for that ultimately. Um, there was talk of excavating a channel between the adjacent wetlands and the ponds to reintroduce flow that used to exist. All of that got cut from the budget, but I know that there's some very committed people in the public works department who want to sort of revisit some of these issues further down the road. There's a, a large open space uh, just east of the site, um, and there's talk of creating a sort of informal trail connection. So it may evolve over time, but I don't know how much involvement Dan or myself will have in that. So. Um, it was, it depends on, you know, what part of the process you're, you're talking about it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there, there were moments where it was incredibly moving and profound. And there were other times where I was literally pulling my hair out because it felt like, you know, everything was about money and we we're always going down and we we're really trying to scrape the bottom of the barrel. So, um, but looking back on it, I mean, I wouldn't change a thing. I think it was an incredible process to be a part of, uh, you know, be, being able to meet the family members in particular was very special. Um, and really sort of teaches you the value of, of life and of resilience. And um, you see, we really saw a, a variety of different approaches to trauma within the family members. Some people who expressed it outwardly, some people who are very closed. Uh, so, you know, it was very educational, it was very eye-opening. Do you wanna share one, one just quick, like if you can, something you observed or uh, well, I think that there's there's a video online that I'm not I, I don't want to go search for it right now. But Joanne Bacon and Trisha Pinto, two mothers of of uh, children who were killed, and they were both on the memorial commission, and they talk about how their kids would have engaged with the site, which is incredibly powerful. Um, and so, yeah, if you look up Joanne Bacon, Trisha Pinto, um, I think, I can't remember what news outlet, it's some local Connecticut TV producer, I think, but. Um, Anything that you seems like there's, you know, incredible um, feeling, um, 
I don't know, like something that's sort of indescribable, right? You have a money thing on one hand, mm -hmm. and this incredible beauty that um, people gathered around to remember. It's just so poignant, it's so beautiful. I think it was a really intuitive space for people. Um, I mean, they used it in a lot of the ways that we imagined that they would, which was somewhat surprising in and of itself. Um, but also, you know, I, w I was only there for two days after the formal opening, so I, I don't have a huge sample size to work off of, but we did see, feel that people spent a lot of time there. And we, we were really curious, are people gonna come here you know, sometimes you go to a memorial, you go, you read the plaque and you walk away. And Dan and I were kind of hanging out at the memorial the day it opened to the general public and we'd see other people there for at least an hour, um, which is a long time to, to spend in a space. So um, that was very surprising actually. That, that, and I think that the nature, is a big part of that. I don't think you want to go sit in front of a big stone shape for, you know, an hour. You, but you're in the woods. You've got a, a path to walk. Yeah. Thank you.